All right, I'm delighted to be here today, and uh, my talk today is going to be, uh, as the title suggests, uh, Challenges in AI Safety from the Perspective of an Autonomous Driving OEM. And OEM is just, it means Original Equipment Manufacturer. Motional uh, is partnered, and I'll, I'll have a slide on this, partnered with Hyundai Motor Corporation, um, so we consider ourselves an OEM uh, developing a, a, an autonomous vehicle. So just a, a quick thing about uh, uh, Motional itself. Um, we're essentially in a, in a similar category as uh, Waymo and Cruise. We're developing an autonomous vehicle, a self-driving vehicle. Um, the technology that uh, comprises our autonomous vehicle software uh, came out of uh, uh, startups from MIT and Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University. And those form the basis of, uh, of our autonomous software, Hyundai, Motor Corporation provides the actual vehicle um, uh, that we're going to be using to, to, to deliver our robo-taxi service. Um, so just a couple of headlines, recent headlines that were announced. Uh, Emotional announced, uh, I believe last year, uh, a partnership with Lyft. Um, and Emotional will be, be providing uh, ride-hailing service through Lyft, but with Emotional's autonomous vehicles. Uh, we currently have some test vehicles operating uh, on the Las Vegas Strip. And uh, so if, and today, if you were, happen to be in Las Vegas, you could actually uh, hail a ride uh, through the Lyft app and you can uh, request an autonomous vehicle and you would be uh, uh, provided that ride with an emotional autonomous vehicle with a safety driver behind the wheel, but most of the time the vehicle would actually be driving itself. Uh, we also recently announced a partnership with Uber Eats uh, where we're actually going to be use, using the emotional autonomous vehicle to, uh, to deliver uh, uh, food, uh, meals through the, through the Uber Eats uh, uh, application. So Essen did a very nice job of introducing me, but just a little bit more on, on some of my technical background. So I uh, started my career um, around 2000. I, I was part of a startup that ended up failing for, <laughs> from 2000 to 2003, and it was not in the autonomy space. So I don't even put it here. Um, but I, I, I worked at um, uh, Draper Laboratory for four years uh, developing fiber optic gyroscopes, uh, uh, rotation sensors for a U.S. Uh, Navy guided system. And again, you can think of that as, a, as, a, um, as an autonomous system, autonomous vehicle, um, where deadly consequences are actually the intent <laughs> of the system, whereas with the current product, we're trying to avoid uh, and the, any type of deadly accidents uh, that could occur from, from the autonomy. Uh, for the next 13 years, I was at uh, GE Global Research in upstate New York. Uh, that's the organization, that they were the uh, R&D, research and development arm for the General Electric Corporation. So I got to a chance to be exposed to uh, hard technical challenge problems for, the, for all of the GE companies. So aviation, transportation, healthcare, um, uh, power generation. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud to say that while I was at GE Global Research, that was my introduction to Stanford and particularly to Professor Michael Kokenderfer. And I'm also very proud to say that in collaboration with Michael and, and, uh, and Robert Moss when he was at MIT Lincoln Lab, uh, I led the group that was the very first uh, industrial organization to test flight the uh, ACAS SXU version, so the a version of ACAS XU collision avoidance uh, system for aircraft that was uh, developed for small, uh, uh, small autonomous vehicles. Uh, and from 2020 to present, been, I've been at Emotional for about a year and a half now. I lead the uh, autonomy safety and uh, safety research organization. Um, so about two weeks ago, I set out to, um, you know, I said to myself, hey, I've got this talk at Stanford coming up. I better start putting some slides together uh, for the presentation. And then I ran across this article uh, from you know three years ago or so, that uh, Elon Musk had uh, declared that the, the self-driving cars were solved. So I said, you know, hallelujah, thank goodness, I don't have to do any work. I can stand here and talk to you about the weather or the San Francisco Giants for an hour. <laughs> but unfortunately, all due respect to Elon Musk, the self-driving, at least at the level four and level five um, uh, levels, where it's completely autonomous, no human interaction whatsoever, it is absolutely categorically not solved. Uh, if, it, if it were solved, I wouldn't have anything to talk about. But there are hundreds, thousands, probably tens of thousands of, of, of the greatest minds, you know, engineers, uh, scientists, researchers, uh, solving some of the hardest challenges. And some of the 
hardest challenges do come from the fact that uh, we use a ton of uh, artificial intelligence to make safety critical decisions. Um, so the outline of my talk is I'm going to first uh, give a little bit of sort of a background on the safety engineering approach. And uh, for folks in my generation and folks that sort of grew up in the engineering or in the engineering profession doing sort of legacy processes around safety engineering, uh, the introduction of AI is just, has just turned those processes on their head. And the, the safety engineering community today even is just is grappling with how to adapt uh, safety engineering processes and methodologies that have served the community extremely well for decades. How do we adapt those uh, to, to account for uh, learning enabled components uh, included in safety, in, in safety critical systems? Uh, it, it, it's, it's a hard problem. Just that by itself is a hard problem. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some key challenges from safe, from, uh, uh, with AI safety that are very specific to the autonomous driving um, community. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some research topics, uh, selected research topics, some of which we're working on with Stanford currently, uh, that I believe, in my opinion, are, are the most promising research areas to deal with these very, very difficult uh, uh, AI problems. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this notion of how do you, um, how do you, um, how do you quantify risk for an autonomous vehicle? How do you know when safe is safe enough? How do you know when you've tested all of the possible things that can go wrong? That's another open area of debate. It's not solved. There are committees, there are research projects that are trying to deal with those things right now, trying to answer those questions. We don't have a good answer for that yet. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about a research project that's going on at Motional right now, being led by one of my colleagues out of the Boston office, that doesn't deal with sort of um, objective safety. It really has more to do with perceived safety, how the public um, interacting with autonomous vehicles on the, on the open roads, how they perceive uh, autonomous vehicles and are things that we can do in the autonomous vehicle to, um, to uh, increase the perception uh, that our vehicle is safe when operating with, with, uh, with other roads. So safe, just a, a, a quick note about safety engineering. So you know, there's a long list of catastrophic events that have, that have occurred you know, throughout, the, throughout the decades uh, uh, from, from uh, um, software bugs, due to software bugs. Okay? And they range from the deadly, uh, as in the case of the um, Toyota un unintended accelerator, the acceleration pedal would just, on its own, you know, hit the floor and accelerate, and the human in the in the driver's seat had no idea or no you know idea how to you know prevent that from happening. And unfortunately, it led to a number of fatalities. Um, the Northeast blackout of 2003. You can see that big area of the Northeast around New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania that was completely blacked out for a number of days. That was caused by a software bug. Okay, that's more disruptive than deadly, but when you lose power. It can have dead, deadly consequences as well for you know, people in nursing homes, people in hospitals, et cetera, that depend on a power source. And then the downright bizarre. So I don't know, this was a few years ago, the Microsoft Hey Bot, where they, they generated this AI uh, bot that would listen in on um, social, um, social media channels, Twitter, um, you know, Twitter, in this case, Twitter, and it would learn conversations and it would, it would start participating in the conversation. Well, if you know the story, that bot went, went bad <laughs> very, very quickly and it started sp spewing out some really, really bad things on social media. So that's an example of, it wasn't necessarily the software that was designed poorly, it was, but it, it was designed correctly, but it was misused. Okay, so there are situations where you can totally design your software completely correctly and people will find a way to misuse it. We do have that problem in autonomous vehicles as well. All right, so if you've ever worked <laughs> in uh, safety engineering or systems engineering, we in the legacy systems engineering community use the, what we call the V model, okay, for safety engineering and systems engineering. On the left-hand side of the V, you, def you define your system. You define high-level requirements for your system. You architect your system. You, you, you allocate requirements to different units of your system. And on the right-hand side of the V, you do your validation and verification. You test all of the possible things, that you try to test the requirements of your system, you try to expose your system to all the possible things that you think can go wrong when the, when the software is being used in the field. Um, and at the end of the day, 
you generate a safety case that says, here's, our, here's the design of our system, here's the requirements that we impose, safety requ and system requirements we impose in our system, here's the tests we did on our system, and here's a list of evidence and arguments that say our system is, is safe. But, uh, to, and, and, and is absent of unreasonable risk. No system is ever going to be completely absent of risk, but you have to make a case that it's absent of unreasonable risk, okay? So again, when we start introducing AI components, learning components, what does it mean to write a requirement for an AI component, okay? You can't say, okay, for all possible inputs of this neural network, the output has to be always be bounded to this range. It's just, it, it's impossible to do. It's, it it's, may not be impossible, but it's very, very difficult to do, okay? And again, there's standards committees right now that are trying to figure this out. What does it mean to write a requirement, a safety requirement for an AI component? We don't know. I'm on, I'm on a committee right now that's trying to do this, and I just had a call with, with one of my colleagues in the UK this morning, and we're trying to answer that question. What do you mean? We don't know. It's a, it's a work in progress, okay? When you have conventional software, and when I talk about conventional software, I'm talking about Python, C, C++, that sort of thing, where you can actually see the inside of the software, and you can debug it, you know, okay, there, I've got this little unit that does this, I've got this little unit that does this. Um, you develop an architecture, um, and you develop an architecture so that you can define little units and what, what little, each little unit and each little function is supposed to do, so that when you go to test it and something goes wrong, you can point to the internal function that went wrong. How do you do that with a neural network? Okay, I don't know. You can, you know, you have nodes, you have layers, you have, you know, convolutional, you have LSTN, you have all the different kinds of neural networks, but the innards are mysterious, what we call unexplainable, okay? Very, very different from conventional software. How do we verify an AI component, okay? How do we know that we've exposed it to all possible input states that, uh, a neural network, a perception network, for example, uh, a, a neural network that's responsible for observing objects in the driving environment and making classifications about pedestrian, bicycle, automobile, tree, dog, uh, person in a wheelchair, person on a scooter, you know. Um, how do we verify that we've captured all the possible things that could go wrong with that AI component? Very, very difficult to do. And then finally, how do we know when we've covered the entire um, set of possible things that this AI component could be exposed to, and how can we reasonably say, how can we um, say with any level of confidence that we've exposed this uh, AI component, this learning component, to uh, enough possible uh, 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 input states that we can say that the, 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 we've reduced the unreasonable risk to a manageable level. Extremely difficult to do. Okay. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention that ISO 26262 is one of the standards that's, that guides the development of automotive software. Um, so it's been used for decades to guide the development of uh, software that has safety implications like your cruise control software in your vehicle, for example. Uh, it's used, for example, on ADAS, autonomous driving uh, assistant systems like the Tesla vehicle, okay? And it really just follows the V model and it tells you to do all of these things. And the reason I have a cross out is because when you try to answer these questions, like, like I've been posing here about how you write a requirement, how do, you ver how do you adequately verify an AI component, frankly, ISO 262 is an epic fail, okay, in that regard. And that's why they, you know, we form these subcommittees to try to address those. There's another standard called ISO 21448 that came, came out very recently. Um, uh, called safety of the intended functionality. Okay, and I, I borrowed this from a from a, a presentation that I thought was really really good uh, about safety of the intended functionality. SODIF. I got that from the internet. It was an ANSYS SODIF in 60 minutes. Uh, there it is. Okay, um, and the idea is ISO 262, which we call functional safety, deals with develop your software so that it it's absent of bugs. Develop your hardware so that your hardware that's hosting your software doesn't cause any failures. So you can imagine that if you have an autonomous vehicle and your hardware is free of failure, uh, your software is free of bugs, there are still things that can go wrong, okay? For example, there's a few examples that are given here. Um, the sun is shining directly into your camera, okay? 
uh, somebody went and pasted something on a stop sign, okay? Somebody, in a, you know, misused something and then put a, you know, I don't know what that picture is, putting a can of uh, 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 energy drink or something on the wheel. I don't know what that means. But there's all kinds of things that can go wrong uh, that can cause your autonomous system, even though it was developed, you know, with, the, with utmost of care, it's still going to fail in the field because of what we call these SODIF issues, okay? So with that, I'm going to, by the way, I should have mentioned at the beginning, feel free to, I'm going to leave some time at the end for questions and answers, but if you have a question that pops up, I'm happy to, you know, entertain any questions that pop up during the, during the talk. Okay, so these are well-known cha known challenges with AI safety, uh, but they are particularly uh, acute problems when you're talking about uh, AI when in, used in, an autonomous, in the context of an autonomous vehicle. Uh, AI is brittle, okay? And what I mean by that is, you know, you train your AI, um, you, know, you set all the weights, you test it and everything. As long as the, um, the neural network is being uh, exposed to inputs that are well within the distribution, the training distribution, it'll probably perform pretty well. But as soon as you get close to that uh, boundary or outside of the distribution, the, the output can be nonsensical. And I used a nonsens nonsensical example just to, 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 uh, to uh, illustrate the point here. You know, a cat, if I give it a, you know, 100 different pictures of a cat, you know, in, a, in an easy to recognize pose, uh, no problem classifying it as a cat. But as soon as I introduce it to some, you know, small variation to that, like the ca cat licking its paw, the neural network was, thinks that it's a cat, you know, eating an ice cream cone. It's nonsensical. Okay, the other challenge is AI is opaque. Okay, again, you may have a very well behaved network and it's very, very well behaved. You give it inputs, it produces an output, it correctly classifies the output. But if it does something slightly wrong or something majorly wrong, how do you go in, like with, with conventional software, you can go into your C++, your Python code, and debug the software. How do you do that with a neural network? Uh, it, it's an open question. And you know, again, there are techniques that are being developed to be able to make AI explainable, but you know, for the purposes that we need to be able to, to, to um, debug code, you know, according to safety engineering practices, it's not quite there yet. Um, intractable state space. Okay, so I talked a little bit about this. In conventional software, uh, we like to be able to understand the entire space, input space that could be an input to our software component during its uh, useful lifetime, okay? Um, and we all like to be able to characterize what the output is going to do given that entire space of input. When you're talking about neural network, especially when you're talking about something like a perception algorithm on an autonomous vehicle, and all, just imagine all the crazy kinds of things that, you know, a branch is hanging over a, um, a traffic light. A traffic light is moving in the wind. A person wearing a costume on Halloween is entering the road. You know, somebody in a bear costume. Just the, 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 the input space for a neural network, convolutional neural network perception algorithm, just, it's intractable, okay? And therefore, there, it's ex extremely difficult to be able to characterize the output space, okay? <clears throat> and then lastly, um, the outputs of a neural network are probabilistic. They're not going to tell you, I, I, I'm going to tell you with 100% certainty that this is a cat, or this is a dog, or this is a banana, or this is a pedestrian. Nope, it's going to say I have X amount of confidence, X percent confidence that this is a pedestrian, uh, that this is an automobile, that this is a bicyclist, that this is a, a scooter entering the road, okay? In an autonomous vehicle, we have to make safety critical decisions based on probabilistic information. So if you've ever taken a course with Michael Kokenderfer, this is <laughs> the classic example of uh, decision making in the presence of uncertainty. Okay, so again, there's a whole panoply of challenges with AI safety. These are ones that I believe are very, very specific and acute for the autonomous driving space. Okay, and I think we talked a little bit about this already. Um, you know, again, AI is brittle. How do you write a requirement that says, for all possible inputs to the neural network, uh, it can never give me a, a wrong classification? Uh, or it can give me a, it gives, give me a wrong classification only, you know, 10% of the time, 5% of the time. Very, very difficult to do. AI is opaque. Um, how do you define an architecture? Uh, how do you define a neural network in such a way that you can test the individual components? Very difficult to do. 
we talked about, how do you verify? Um, you know, in your, in your validation and verification, you want to expose your neural network or your safety critical software system to all the possible things that you think they could be exposed to in the wild, you know, when it's actually in operation. And we do this with a combina combination of simulations, so we can run millions of simulations uh, and expose our, our software uh, to all kinds of scenarios and simulation. We can do closed course testing where we actually drive the vehicle with the software around on a closed course where we have control over what, you know, what the vehicle is going to be exposed to. And then finally, we have what we call public road evaluation, where we have very, very controlled conditions like a chase car, you know, one, a, a human-driven vehicle behind and in front of the autonomous vehicle when we're testing it so they can drive out on the road and gather data and you can test. So there's a, there's a number of ways that you can do it, but actually being able to confidently say that you've exposed your software to the entire uh, universe of things that it may experience in the wild is very, very difficult to do. So I'm going to talk um, in a second about some of the uh, research topics that I think are, um, are um, very promising for addressing some of these issues. And, uh, but let me, let me first talk about um, a typical autonomous vehicle software. So uh, autonomous vehicles operate on the sense plan act uh, methodology. So you have the sense uh, block where you have a number of sensors that your vehicle is driving around. It's got cameras, it's got lidars, it's got radars, it's got you know sometimes sonars, um, and and these are intended to be able to um, sense everything in the environment. Okay, the, the autonomous vehicle needs to know uh, where are the pedestrians, where are the crosswalks, where are the traffic lights, where are the uh, intersections, uh, where are the curbs? Is that a building over there? Is there, is there an intersection here? Is there a left turn? All kinds of things, and the sensors help do that. And we use a um, uh, multi multimodal sensors, meaning you know cameras, LIDARs, and radars, because each of those uh, has, has uh, benefits and, and drawbacks uh, in an in in environment. So cameras, for example, are very, very good at doing uh, classification of objects, but they, they're not very good at night. They're not very good when you're facing into the sun, uh, that sort of thing. Radars are very, very good at uh, detecting range and velocity of other vehicles. Um, but if you're driving near you know, iron structures, Near, near Iron Bridge or something, there's a lot of iron bridges in Pittsburgh, uh, you get a lot of spurious reflections from your radar. Uh, similar with LIDAR. There's some things that LIDAR is really, really good at uh, and some things that it's not a good at. So you put, take all these sensors, you put all of, all of them on your vehicle. When I showed that picture of the um, of uh, Motional's vehicle, you could see a whole bunch of sensors. And I'm sure you see, like, their cruise, cruise vehicles drive around here a lot. I know, and you see those, you see those things uh, on it all the time. Okay, so that's the sensors. The semantic map is where you have a, like a Google Maps version of the, <clears throat> the space that the vehicle's gonna be driving in. But, you know, I mean, and, and there are some instances where the vehicle can learn on its own what the features are in a map, okay? But it's more typical that you'll have a Google Map representation of the streets uh, and the, you know, the urban environment that the vehicle's gonna drive through and a human has to take those Google Maps and manually annotate. This is a tree. This is a curb. This is the, this is the lane divider. This is the intersection. Um, this is a stop sign. Okay. And the, yes? Could you explain, maybe I missed this, but why are there two semantic maps? What's it's, the uh, yeah, good question. It's actually the same semantic map that's used in, in both instances. Okay. There's not two separate semantic maps. There's... And I, it's just, I didn't want to draw a line going from one semantic map over to the other. So one semantic map, it's used in, in, in multiple locations, okay? And in these steps, like in sense, it's a semantic map that's in like this state, and in a plan, it changes, or is, is, is that when the update takes place? Yeah, so, so, okay, so the semantic map itself doesn't change, but the part of the map that you're interested in is going to be different, okay? Because I may, I, have a, I may have a semantic map for the entire uh, space that I'm going to be driving through in Las Vegas, let's say. And there are selected routes and streets uh, that are mapped out, okay? But if I'm driving near the Luxor Casino, let's say, I only care about the map features that are within, say, 100 meters of where I am now, okay? So the vehicle has to know which portion of the map to 
uh, to invoke, to pull at any point in time. Okay? And it uses, the, uses the, um, uh, the localization function to be able to know. The vehicle has to know where it is to know which portion of the map it's driving in. Okay? So if the localization is wrong, okay, if there's error in your localization, you're going to make a mistake about which portion of the map that you pull in. Okay? Yes? Say again? What do you ground truth on? Uh, again, we, so we ground, you're talking about in the, in the generation of the semantic map? Uh, no, so in terms of uh, localization of the car, like, do you guys use slam or is it? It's a, it's a vert, I, so I can't get into the, like the super technical details, but it's, a, it's, a, it's very similar to slam, yes. Yep. Okay, good questions. All right. Okay, so the, in the sense block, Again, we've got sensors, we've got a semantic map that tells us where we are and what the features are in the area that we're driving in. And then again, this ego localization, where again, we have to do some, some version of SLAM, okay, um, using sensor information at the, at, you know, um, uh, immediate sensor information to tell us where we are in the map, okay. Uh, all of that gets fed into a, uh, a neural network that has to um, generate uh, a list of tracked objects, okay. So the, the perception prediction neural network has to say, okay, that's a pedestrian over there, and that pedestrian is, you know, 10 meters away from me and moving, you know, at this speed in this direction, that's a vehicle, and the heading of that other vehicle is, you know, this many degrees with respect to some reference, and all of these things have to be uh, uh, um, produced in real time, okay? on, you know, on iterations of tens or hundreds of milliseconds every time, you know, at every instance, uh, all of these things. And again, just imagine the types of things that can go wrong with that, okay? Uh, you're never going to have perfect knowledge of the, of the scene. You're never going to have perfect localization. You're never going to have perfect estimates of positions, velocities, headings uh, of the other agents in the scene, okay? You also have to predict where these agents are going to be in the future, okay? Most uh, predict, per, perception prediction systems in autonomous vehicles tell you, make estimates of where those things are right now, but they also make estimates about where they're going to be a few seconds from now, okay? And that's, that's, that's not easy to do. So what the sense, ultimately the sense block produces this list of tracked objects in the scene. And then again, we use the same semantic map, but we use a section of the semantic map that's relevant to where the vehicle is right now. Um, and the eagle localization to say, okay, I'm right here. This is the map that I'm in. This is the, this is the um, uh, environment that I'm driving in. And this is the list of static and dynamic objects in the scene. So now I have to create an optimal trajectory. I have to plan an optimal path for the ego vehicle uh, to drive through. And again, you have to optimize for, obviously, first and foremost, you have to optimize for not colliding with other, we call them BRUs, vulnerable road users, pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, automobiles, okay? You don't want to collide with the static infrastructure either. You don't want to hit a telephone pole. You don't want to hit a stop sign. Uh, you don't want to cross the. Um, you don't want to cross the um, the stop line for an intersection. Okay. Um, you want to make sure that you maintain sufficient clearance from other from other actors in the scene. Uh, there's also more subtle things that you have to do, like uh, following the rules of the road. Okay, maintaining the the proper speed limit. Okay. This is where the annotated map comes in, okay? The annotated map's gonna tell you the speed limit in this section of road is 35 miles per hour. There's a speed bump over there, so reduce your velocity. Any of those things you get wrong, the vehicle's not gonna be able to react to them because it's not gonna know, okay? Um, so again, with this imperfect information that's fed to the motion planner, the motion planner has to make its best guess on the safest path for the vehicle to follow. And then, th that, so that's the plan part, and then the act part is it provides a trajectory to the actual vehicle, and uh, that gets turned into um, control commands, throttle, brake, um, and uh, steering. Okay, those are the three control actions that, that a vehicle do, throttle, brake, and steering. Okay? So, when we talked about the challenge of AI being brittle, okay, as long as uh, the stop sign and the pedestrian uh, is in, you know, perfectly visible, and I can see the whole pedestrian, they're not occluded by some other pedestrian, they're not occluded by a bush, they're not occluded by a stop sign or a mailbox, no problem. I'll, have, I'll do a pretty good job of classifying and, and predicting their future state. 
Um, and this is where SODIF comes in, safety of the intent and functionality. There's all kinds of things, environmental factors, curvature of the road, that can cause your sensors to imperfectly and not faithfully represent the ground truth of the scene that you're in, okay? The motion planner has no concept of that. The motion planner sa just says, the information I'm getting for perception, that's, that's the best information that I have, okay? So again, this, uh, this problem of uh, uh, inputs to the neural network that are out of distribution uh, or near the distribution boundary that could cause you to misclassify <coughs> misclassify an object uh, tend to you know turn out being severe. <clears throat> and you might say, well, you know, if I misclassify a pedestrian as a mailbox, let's say, um, you know, pedestrian stand, standing on the on the on the sidewalk, if I misclassify it as a mailbox. I'm still okay because the vehicle is not going to, it's going to try to avoid hitting the mailbox, okay? And that's true, but remember, we're, we're making predictions about where these things are going to be in the future. So if I classify something as a mailbox, I'm going to assume that it's going to stay there, okay? If it's really a pedestrian, then it has the possibility at any moment of stepping into the road and, uh, you know, causing, you know, I, I, can, I can collide with it. So the brittleness of AI is, is, is particularly um, troublesome there. AI is opaque. So let's say, again, we're testing out our perception algorithm. We're feeding it all these inputs. Uh, we feed it an input, and it gives us the wrong answer, OK? Conventional software, you can go in, you can debug your Python, you can de debug your C pretty quickly. Much more difficult to do uh, when we're talking about a neural network. Um, this is one I, I was just talking about. The motion planner is getting imperfect uh, information from, it could get imperfect wrong information from the semantic map. It could get, not could, it will. It will get wrong information from the localization system. It will get wrong information from the perception prediction system, okay? And yet, it still has to make safety critical decisions. It cannot, it cannot cause a collision, okay? <clears throat> so, given those challenges, I'm going to talk just briefly about some of the research topics in AI safety that I think are more promising uh, the most promising ones to deal with these, okay? Uh, the first one is this notion of um, con uh, uncertainty aware AI, okay? And there's a, you know, I just put up some, some papers on, you know, calibration of neural networks and uncertain. There's a lot more. In fact, I think Michael Kokendurfer's, one of Michael Kokendurfer's students published a paper uh, uh, a year or two ago around uh, being able to detect when, when an input is out of distribution. Um, and I believe that this uh, area of research is going to mature more quickly than making neural networks more robust to, to um, you know, more robust and less brittle. And the idea here is, if I get an input to my neural network um, that's going to cause me to make a wrong classification, if I can be made aware of that, okay, I can do something about it. If you think about yourself as a driver, okay, if you're coming on, there, you have uncertainty all the time uh, when you're making decisions when you're driving, okay? You're, you're, you're driving down the road and there's a bunch of parked cars along the side. You're aware that, you know, some kid may uh, come, you know, run out uh, or a bicycle or a scooter. They run out. You don't see it. It's not in your current view, field of view, but you know that it could happen, okay? So in the same way, if a neural network could um, actually detect and give us notification that there may, we may have difficulty correctly classifying an input, we can, we can account for that in the motion planner. We might uh, slow down. We might uh, you know, be more cautious as we proceed down the road as we, in, instead of how we would otherwise do it. So I th again, I think this notion of uncertainty on, uh, aware uh, AI uh, confidence, uh, uh, it has to be reliable though. It has to be reliable. You can't just take the output like of a softmax layer uh, and trust that. The softmax uh, uh, confidence scores are, 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 are notoriously unreliable. Um, but this idea of AI being opaque, and I talked earlier about um, you know, validation and verification where we have to expose our agent <clears throat> to as many possible scenes as, as we can um, and try to you know, assess the behavior of it. Um, Again, and, and if something goes wrong, we'd like to dig in and understand into our code <clears throat> what went wrong. Again, because AI is opaque, it's very difficult to do. So Michael Kokendurfer, Anthony Corso, Robert Moss, 
uh, a couple of years ago introduced me to this uh, concept of adaptive stress testing and uh, black box methods in general for assessing um, uh, safety critical aspects of, of, of neural network code. And, it, it, and we've applied it. I know that Stanford has applied it to an autonomous vehicle. I'll show, show that in a second. Uh, when I was at GE, we applied the adaptive stress testing method to find uh, difficult to find yet still probable failures in a trajectory uh, planner for an, uh, for, for an aircraft, okay? So I, again, this whole notion of developing black box methods that are adaptive um, so that they can more rapidly get to a failure state than say a typical um, uh, random uh, um, uh, uh, Monte Carlo, random Monte Carlo sap sampling, I think AST is very promising in that regard in being able to rapidly discover um, failures in, in a black box system. This is, I, I bar and I told Anthony I was gonna use this um, so I don't get in trouble. This is uh, an example of adaptive stress testing that was applied to an autonomous vehicle using an intelligent open source intelligent driver model in that vehicle and um, the system under test was the intelligent driver model and um, they had developed an adversarial agent based on reinforcement learning that would adaptively perturb some stochastic environmental variables and would find the most likely sequence of uh, sampled variables that would lead to a collision. In this particular video, the, um, um, in this particular uh, research work, the, um, the acceleration, the velocity and the acceleration, I don't know if it was position velocity or acceleration of the pedestrian were perturbed and the noise on the uh, sensor for the perception algorithm was perturbed and they found this, this you know, uh, conspiracy of values of these stochastic variables that caused the intelligent driver model to believe that it had a conflict-free path when in fact there was a pedestrian there and it struck the pedestrian. So we are currently working on uh, ad uh, uh, incorporating adaptive stress testing to test our motion planner uh, at Motional. Harrison Delecki here, one of your colleagues, is, uh, is, is helping us to do that. And Anthony Corso are working on trying to adapt this adaptive stress testing approach to try to find failures in our, in our, in our uh, uh, motion planner, Motional's motion planner. And lastly, decision making under uncertainty. Um, let me first talk about uncertainty. If you're familiar with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, I like to think of these as like the four horsemen of the apocalypse for uncertainty for autonomous systems. So first you have multimodal uncertainty, okay? Uncertainty around the future behaviors of other actors in the scene, okay? You may be driving along, there's a pedestrian walking along the side of the road. You have no idea if that pedestrian is gonna turn and start jaywalking into the road, okay? Um, if you're driving, the ego vehicle is driving along there in the blue, there's another vehicle driving on the right. Um, we, you know, we have to make predictions about what that agent vehicle and all the objects in the scene, we have to make predictions about what those are gonna do. The case of the orange agent vehicle, it could keep going straight. Uh, it could you know, cut into our lane you know, quite a bit ahead of us and then make a left turn, or it could abruptly cut in, okay? We just don't know what's going to do you know, several seconds out. So we have to make predictions about those types of things. Uh, existence uncertainty is the second of the four horsemen of uncertainty, um, and this is, there are all kinds of things that can cause what we call false, false positives. There, there are little things, a, a, a ghost vehicle can pop into the scene, okay? Um, and if a ghost vehicle, your perception algorithm thinks that there's something there, and it's gonna be telling the motion planner, hey, you better react to that, you better brake, start braking because there's something there. Well, it turns, out, if it turns out that it's a ghost vehicle, and you brake, you have unintended braking, which can cause other safety uh, issues, like you, somebody can run into you from behind, okay? The, the next one is uh, track uncertainty. Uh, track uncertainty means that, um, I think I, I, I touched on this earlier, I'm making, I'm making estimates of positions, velocities, and headings, okay, of all of the objects in the scene, okay? Um, those, those all will, will have error associated with them. Okay, I'm gonna have error in the position, estimated position, of the other agents in the scene, errors in their velocities, errors in their headings, okay? And then the last one is classification uncertainty, which I think we've talked about a lot. And I mentioned earlier that um, we, we, we drive Motional's vehicles on the Las Vegas Strip, uh, and I've had the privilege of riding in, in that, that vehicle twice in the back of the uh, Motional's vehicle on the Las Vegas Strip. 
You want to talk about crazy? So, I mean, <laughs> the, the, nobody followed them. No pedestrians follow the rules there. They don't care if the light's red or green. They're just going to cross the road. Uh, people are walking around with crazy costumes. They're doing crazy things. Uh, pe you know, people are drunk and they're walking around like brownie in motion. It's nuts, okay? It's nuts, okay? The fact that our, our vehicles can safely navigate through, through scenes like that is nothing short of amazing to me. Okay, so one of the reasons why we care so much about this uncertainty is when we generate a trajectory for our motion planner, for the vehicle to follow, uh, we want to do a collision cost, okay? We want to say, do we predict that our ego's trajectory is going to intersect with any of those predicted trajectories of those, of those um, vehicles, of those other vehicles, pedestrians in the scene, okay? And there's a lot of research done that says that, uh, you know, there's curves that say, if you strike a pedestrian at, uh, I, I can't read what the numbers are, but at 10 miles an hour, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, uh, you know, five, 10 miles an hour, you're not likely to cause severe injury. I mean, you know, I might, you know, give them a bruise or something. Once you start getting like 30, 40 miles per hour, as you get higher and higher speed, the likelihood of causing severe injury or death goes up dramatically, okay? Um, and so when you think about predicting positions, velocities, and headings of these future, um, uh, uh, of these future predictions for these agents in the scene, pedestrians and automobiles and bicyclists, we have to make a, uh, a prediction about if we were to strike them, what would be the kinetic energy transfer, okay? That's, one, that's a, a common method that people are using now to, uh, it's not just collision, but if there is a collision, what is the expected kinetic energy transfer between the vehicle and that other object, okay? And as, as you can imagine, that kinetic energy calculation uh, is gonna be dramatically affected by these uncertainties, okay? By the position, the heading, and the velocity of those other actors in the scene, okay? So this is one way that these errors can manifest themselves in, you can incorrectly uh, uh, undercalculate the amount of kinetic energy that you would transfer. You can, and, you know, so which, which would be uh, an unsafe situation. You can incorrectly overcalculate um, uh, how much kinetic energy, you may think that you're going to uh, transfer a lot of kinetic energy when in fact you're, you're not even gonna, uh, you're gonna graze that object or you're not even gonna touch it, which would may cause you to, to break unnecessarily, okay? All right, so this is, a, this is a project that's near and dear to Essen's heart and, and Ellie and Alex who are contributing to this. I, was, I couldn't get the version that had Ellie and Alex's names on there. But this idea of uh, reachability analysis, reachable states. So we, ju and we just started this like early this year. Uh, and Essen and team have made a lot of progress on this. And then this notion of calculating the reachable states for agents in the scene, okay? And Essen and team are putting together a simulation in uh, Carlo currently where they're trying to predict the reachable states of agents in a scene and then if you have an ego trajectory can you if the ego trajectory uh, uh, intersects at all with any of those reachable states then you can assume that there's a collision and we're going she's going to and she and the team are going to expand that to include uh, uncertainties around right now you're only include uh, including position uncertainty you're starting to at acceleration uncertainty, steering uncertainty, but we've got to get heading uncertainty. Anyway, I think this is a promising approach. As Essen will tell you, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of research being done out there on reachability analysis applied to this type of problem. One of the big challenges is though, making it um, computationally efficient. Because remember, you have limited compute resources on these vehicles, and these algorithms have to run, iterate, you know, 10 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, you need to have Techniques, techniques may, may work very well in simulation, but when you actually try to run them on a target uh, hardware with limited resources uh, and limited time to iterate, uh, computational efficiency becomes very important. Um, there's an, another project that I'm doing with a small company called Critical Systems Labs out of Vancouver. They're supporting us. And they're doing something that's quite similar to what Essen is doing, but it's a, but, but, uh, we're not really using the you know formal reachability analysis. We're saying um, so those those expand those those sort of fans that are fanning out are what are the where are the possible locations that these agents can be at future steps in time based on where they are where we detect them to be now and this idea of maximum control authority. Okay, so if we did, if we if we um, 
classify something as a bicycle, uh, we know that it's not going to be able to go 50 miles an hour. Okay? If we classify something as a pedestrian, we know that uh, you know, it's not going to be a high-speed runner. Not every individual is going to be you know, an, Olympic, an Olympic athlete. So we can put limits on um, you know, what we call their maximum control authority. And this notion of you know, what are the possible future states that these things can be, that these agents can be in. And then we can do a sort of a probabilistic calculation of, of, of collision and kinetic energy transfer. Um, the reachability analysis and the um, maximum control authority and heat maps notion are things that you can do after a trajectory has been generated by your motion planner. So your motion planner generates a trajectory. You can use these techniques to test whether your trajectory will actually be in a you know, future collision with any of these agents. Um, but they don't deal with the generation of the trajectory in the first place, okay? Some work that, that uh, is generally called stochastic MPC, model predictive control, is really looking at how do you incorporate these uncertainties into the optimization process where you're generating your trajectory in the first place, okay? And if you're familiar with model predictive controls, you have a, you have a model of your system and you're trying to um, uh, generate an optimal control action that will result in the next future state, the optimal next future state, okay? Uh, and stochastic MPC is, is, is saying, okay, if I now have multiple possible future states of these other actors in the scene, uh, both in position, velocity, and heading, how do, we, how do I incorporate that into my optimization, okay? And it really has to do with con how, you, how you establish the constraints for your, for your uh, optimizer, for your solver, okay? In, in traditional MPC, uh, the constraints are, you just have inequality constraints. So this variable has to, you know, has to be less than the delta uh, in order to come up with an ultim optimal solution. One of the things that stochastic MPC looks at is, instead of having just an, a straight inequality constraint, you look at what is the probability that these constraints will, um, will um, you know, will be below a certain, a certain threshold over, over some time step. One of the other things that they do, uh, and, and I, I've got sort of links to these, and this is going to be recorded and made available for everyone. So um, if I've got one possible predicted path for an agent in my scene, and that is he's driving along me, the vehicle's driving alongside me, it's most likely it is going to keep on going, but it could abruptly cut in front of me, okay? One of the things that one of these papers does is it says, okay, can I sort of blend those future states together and so that I'm not bouncing around with my control algorithms, you know, on this iteration, I'm assuming that it's going straight, so I set up control action for myself to deal with that. But if it cuts in front of me, then, you know, I haven't, I haven't planned for the optimal control action. But if I consider both the nominal and the worst case and I sort of blend those states together, then I can come up with an optimal control action that, uh, that, that, that is um, uh, resilient to, to all future possibilities. And the one on the left is if, if I constrain my control action to account for nominal versus worst case. So a lot of good research being done there. And there's a bunch of other stuff. There's this probabil probabilistic safety envelopes, uh, chance constrained optimization, which I talked about a bit. There is uh, more and more research being done on taking a POMDP approach. If you've ever worked with or taken a class from Michael Kokendurfer, you know that he's uh, he he really likes on Palm DPs and the world expert at Palm DPs. So all really interesting stuff. So um, I do want to just sort of briefly talk about. I want to make sure I leave quest, uh, time for more Q and A at the end. Um, so again, this is another open question around how you quantify risk uh, in autonomous vehicles. And, and um, Robert has been doing, through the Center for AI Safety, has been doing some really interesting work with Allstate that uh, I became aware of late last year, and I've been continuing to sort of investigate this because I think there's, there's something there. Um, but in the, in, in the autonomous vehicle space, when we talk about risk, uh, there's this notion of positive risk balance, okay? And if, you've, if you're familiar with the uh, Hippocratic Oath, it's a first do no harm, okay? So in order to gain the trust of the public, as we introduce these autonomous systems into, in, you know, onto public roads. We want to make sure that what we have what's called a positive risk balance, which means that if it had been a human driver, or when you put an autonomous vehicle on the road, it doesn't 
increase the amount of risk that you would have had if it were a human driver, okay? And the AV autonomous vehicle community likes to tout the fact that uh, autonomous vehicles don't drive drunk, they don't text while driving, okay? They don't, they don't, uh, uh, they're not distracted when they're driving, unless they have bad inputs, of course. Um, and a, 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 about two thirds of all accidents in the US are caused by distracted driving, impaired driving, and um, I think the third one was the violations of the rules of the road, okay? So I think, you know, the autonomous vehicles have the promise of, of having what we call a positive risk balance, okay? But, but these committees that are coming up with these notions of, of risk, they haven't really given us any sort of metrics or methodologies to quantify uh, how much risk there is, okay? So, and uh, Robert will, will be very familiar with this, uh, uh, I, took these, I took these from a report from Allstate. So from an, insur from an insurer's perspective, when an insurer cares about whether they're insuring a human-driven vehicle, autonomous vehicle, or a person's life, they care about severity uh, versus frequency, okay? How frequent is a loss uh, expected to happen, and how frequent is, is it expected to happen? When we're talking about autonomous vehicles, uh, it's very, very hard to generate the entire distribution because there's some RAND study that said you have to drive like a billion miles uh, to get a statistically significant estimate of, you know, how many collisions an autonomous vehicle would have throughout its lifetime, okay? Um, let me talk about this, this histogram. So what the Allstate work with Robert has done is, that, is it's um, in simulation. They've run a, a, several intelligent driver models in simulation and uh, exposed them to all different kinds of snares, and I think they used adaptive stress testing as well to generate that. But they binned uh, the severities of collisions uh, according to um, closing rate, right? The closing rate. And the closing rate is a function of if I do collide with something, how likely is it to cause minor injury, uh, moderate injury, severe injury, death, okay? And they, they normalized this, this sort of severity scale and they came up with sort of a histogram of uh, the likelihood of frequency of, 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 of different types of events. And then what I thought was really innovative and interesting is that they borrowed some techniques and methodologies from the financial industry. Where the financial industry, when you, you know, you're, you're managing a stock portfolio, the future performance of a stock portfolio or any financial, uh, um, any financial product is non-deterministic, it's probabilistic. But financial institutions need to be able to plan for you know, worst case events. And so they developed this metric called value at risk, which says, if I establish how much risk I'm willing to, um, to incur, okay, what is the probability that in the, over the next, say, month, year trading cycle, what's the probability that I'm actually going to incur a, 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 a loss event, a financial loss event, at that level or higher, okay? And they, again, I thought this was very innovative, applied that metric to this uh, distribution of frequency versus celerity of collisions for an autonomous vehicle. We, we don't have this whole distribution for autonomous. Nobody has this whole distribution for an autonomous vehicle because you just have to drive too many miles to generate it, especially the, the, the long tail, okay? But if we can generate part of the distribution, okay, uh, we could actually estimate, in fact, one of my colleagues, Emotional, uh, wrote a paper that says that if you have like the the left part of the distribution, you can infer the, a log normal distribution and make, and make uh, uh, estimates based on that. But, but with this metric, if we had this distribution, we could now say, you know, if, if we um, say that we're not willing to, in, autom in our AV operation, we're not willing to tolerate a uh, collision uh, with a severity above, say, severe injury, we could actually use this methodology to calculate the probability um, that we'll actually incur an event like that. And it's a, it's a nice metric. So um, just real quick, because I'm running out of time here. The standards committee, all, uh, um, I don't know if I shared this with you yet, Robert. I think I might have. Um, standards committees are trying to think about this too. And there was a recent paper that came out from some researchers in Sweden that are developing this quantitative risk norm, okay? Because positive risk balance really just says, hey, I don't want to cause a collision, or I don't want to cause more collisions than a human driver would cause. But the, the, the standard, there's one sort of research, the researchers from Sweden which are, on, are helping to develop standards are saying, well, we need to bucket these, uh, 
collision events into levels of severity, okay? And develop this quantitative risk norm that says, okay, um, can we have a metric that says we're not likely to have a, 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 a collision above some, above some uh, severity? And I think it, 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 it dovetails very nicely. It's totally independent from the work you did with Allstate, but I think it dovetails very nicely if you could actually attach the VAR calculation to this notion of a quantitative risk norm. Okay, uh, last topic. Um, and this is the one that I was talking about, and this is from my colleague Paul Schmidt, who works out of the Boston office for Motional. He's been doing this work for about a year, uh, and this has to do with perceived safety, not objective safety, but perceived safety. And it's, it, it's, it's an expressive robotics project, okay? So imagine you're walking down the street, you're a pedestrian, you're walking in traffic, okay, and you're getting ready to cross the road, um, and there's vehicles you know, in the road coming towards you. What sort of cues are you looking for as a human? What sort of things are you looking for to um, give yourself assurance that the vehicle is going to stop, okay, prior to you coming out on the road, okay? And that was really the basis for, for this uh, study. And what they did was they built a virtual environment, uh, and there's one of my colleagues, Kim Ryan, with, with VR glasses there. And they had some, um, you know, they picked some random participants, emotional employee participants, to walk around in this virtual environment with autonomous vehicles driving around. And they experimented what sorts of gestures could the AV uh, express to give the person in the virtual world confidence and actually step out onto the, virtually step out onto the road. And you may have seen, you may see uh, vehicles driving around, autonomous vehicle with these lights uh, that, are, that, are, that are intended to sort of give you a visual cue um, of what the vehicle is intending to do. Uh, but it turns out that the flashing lights didn't work so well. So what, what, what this team um, is, we experimented with are things like expressive deceleration, where the vehicle would actually, when it sensed that there was a pedestrian on the side of the road, it would, it would expressively decelerate. In other words, it would let you know that it was decelerating, okay, by you know, making like brake sounds or tipping the nose forward, uh, stopping short of where it would normally stop if there were not a pedestrian there. And they ran a bunch of these studies with uh, with human participants, so this is an example of you know brake sounds, um, you know reducing the RPM, like, you know winding down the engine, and some some of these were actually fake fake sounds. But if the vehicle could be you know trained on what sorts of cues it could give to the to the uh, pedestrian public, uh, that would give them more confidence. Um, so anyway, they did th this this work is published and is being presented at ICRA in May, um, and they and they found some interesting results around you know. Some, some, like the vehicle stopping short ahead of uh, where it would normally stop turned out to be a, a cue that uh, uh, gave the virtual, I mean the pedestrians in the virtual environment confidence that they could step into the road um, and then stopping, stopping short behavior. I said I was going to leave time for questions and I took up all the time. But, uh, thank you. That, that's the end of my talk, but um, I did want to leave you that. Sorry, Elon. <laughs> Hopefully this talk has convinced you that the Thomas driving, self-driving cars is categorically not solved. No way, not even close. All right, thanks. I hope we have time, I hope we have time for questions. Thank you very much. This is the end of the time, but maybe we have one question. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned the um, simulation environment, and I was wondering how you um, are sure that the simulation environment is representative of real world driving? That is, that is an unbelievably good question. We don't. The, the short answer is that we don't. Uh, and we're actually currently conducting correlation. So the question was, hey, we can run all these scenarios in simulation with our autonomous vehicle, uh, but how do we know that that, that um, set of uh, conditions and scenarios are truly representative of what the vehicle is going to um, experience in the real world? It's a great question, and we're currently conducting a correlation study where we're running situations in, situations in uh, simulation, and we're comparing those to the types of situations that our actual vehicles are being exposed to on the road and, and trying, to, trying to correlate those two and trying to get the simulation to be more representative. And there's a whole field of study uh, around that as well. So do we have time for any other questions? Oh, yeah, for people have to leave. I, and I'm sorry I took up all the time, but uh, thank you very much. Well, if you, no?
Yeah, if people can, I'm happy to stick around yeah. if people want to stick around and ask more questions. But thank you very much.